coming and supporting your local independent bookstore. We're so happy that you're here. Um, my name is Monica Golden, and I will be helping to host the event this afternoon. Uh, I'll do my best to, uh, as latecomers come in, have them maybe hover in the back or maybe hover up over here. It's wonderful that we have a full house, so I'll do my best to make seats available for anybody else. Before we begin, if you can turn off your cell phones, just so we don't have ringers going on. I know we all appreciate that. Can you speak a bit louder, please? I sure can. <laughs> So I have just a brief uh, introduction this afternoon because I know all of you here are here because of Miss Nancy Novak. We are so honored to have her with us today. As many or most of you know, she is the founder of Nancy's List and Nancy's Club. For anyone involved in cancer, whether as a patient or caregiver, I Am With You, Love Letters to Cancer Patients, provides brave counsel. 46 authors for cancer survivors and their loved ones have all contributed to this beautiful collection. Please help me give a warm welcome to Ms. Nancy Novak.
process. One, my daughter-in-law once said to me, this book is not about cancer, this is about living. And I think it touches more than just the people who've had cancer right now that. And uh, I'm honored by that, you know, that, that we're able to do that. Um, but people started coming and people started writing and, and there were many more stories we could have told. But I want to tell you that there's some of the wonderful, wonderful people who made this possible are in this room today. I wish we had the luxury of being able to tell you, let them tell you their whole story, but we don't. So they're going to stick around. They'll tell their stories to anyone who wants to listen. They um, will sign your books. They're amazing, amazing people. And I am so grateful to be in the company of this group. So if I just stand up, if I call your name, can you just stand up and wave this on? OK, Judy? Oh, we have to say Oh, you want me to say something? Well, just something. Ah. So, I too am a remote variant cancer survivor, 17 years, and I always like to say they had a sale on cancer when I was diagnosed because I had endometrial cancer at the same time, two for the price of one. Oh. And my doctor said also, this is going to be a really tiring, death defying fight, fight, but if you give it your all, I'm giving it my all. And 17 years later, you're in.
1997, and they wanted to take out my bladder and replace it with all kinds of stupid things <laughs> that were totally intolerable. So I denied their wish to do that, and instead I did a bladder sparing protocol. Well, everything was fine till last year, 1990. I mean, 2014, I had another issue with muscle invasive bladder cancer. They wanted to take out my bladder again, and I told them no. <laughs> and uh, I'm cancer free right now, and hopefully for as many days as I have left to be on this wonderful place. And I'm really grateful for my family and my friends who are scattered throughout the room tonight, and uh, really happy to be here. of oral cancer that cost me a part of my tongue, a lot of my jaw, and um, part of my left breast is on permanent loan to my mouth. Um, they, they, so I have a very interesting anatomy. I can go to the podiatrist and they're like, what's going on with you? All moved around. Um, and uh, I had you know, it threatened my life and my ability to talk, but um, they said I had a 2% chance of surviving. And in March, I celebrated 22 years. and I had to take CEU units, and so I signed up for this class. Well, it took me taking that same course three times. <laughs> Every year, September comes around or whatever, and I took it again. And when I walked in there, I was hoping I would be a better therapist for the cancer population that I was serving, but as it turned out, I instantly knew that this was about my relationship with my cancer, and that I was gonna use every one of those how many hours? 36 hours? <laughs> to really understand myself and my thinking. And it was brilliant. And I'm slow at learning, so it took me three courses. But Rachel has inspired me and been my teacher and my support. And I know you're going to love her because she is, she's wonderful. She's wonderful. I'm so delighted that she's with me. It feels so good. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Can you hear me with it? Yes. Am I loud enough? Good. If I start to mumble even more, um, so um, this is supposed to be a book reading. That's what they call these things. And I've been asked to read. <laughs> so I'm going to read, and then I want to talk about um, the will to live. And the first story I'm going to read is about uh, you. And the next story I'm going to read is about me. The story about you has been written by someone called Stephen Baum, who is a wonderful writer and who turns out to be your son. <laughs> <laughs> and this is called um, The Art of Fall. The Art of Fall. I know how to fall. I realized this in midair. After a year of training for a triathlon and just days before the race, I crashed my bike at 40 miles an hour into the side of a crossing pickup truck. Doctors and nurses were all shocked that I survived. They repeatedly told me that I should be dead or at least severely paralyzed. Not only did I survive, 
I escape without head, neck, or spinal injuries, or even road rash. Surprising to me, I knew how to fall, and it saved my life. I now realize that knowing how to fall is less about physical talent and more about a mental acceptance. It's about embracing the reality of the moment. In the few seconds before I hit the truck, when it was clear that I was going to crash, I unexpectedly let go. Thankfully, this was an uncharacteristic moment. For once in my life, I didn't try to control the situation. I didn't try to cleverly maneuver the bike. I didn't even brace myself. I was without tightness or resistance. The bike took the full impact of the collision. I was launched over the hood of the truck, landing face down on the asphalt, four broken bones in my pelvis, alive. I imagine that being diagnosed with cancer is like crashing into that truck. Everything is fine until that instant when it isn't. Life becomes barely recognizable. The flood of unanswerable questions quickly starts to come. Will I live? For how much longer? Am I strong and brave enough to survive? Will I suffer? Will it be painful? Will I die? Will I make the right choices? Will family and friends support me? Do I have the best medical care? Will I tolerate and respond to treatment? And this anxious noise goes on and on and on. This was the case for my 60-year-old mother, Nancy Novak, who after complaining that about abdominal pain to her internist, was diagnosed with stage four ovarian cancer, a virtual death sentence. She miraculously beat it, defying overwhelming odds, defying, excuse me, overwhelming odds. More than 10 years have now passed and the doctors are still mystified by her ability to overcome such dire circumstances. Many say that surviving cancer is all about the fight, Watching my mother go through her diagnosis, aggressive treatment, and eventual recovery convinced me that paradoxically, it's actually about letting go. Just like in those fleeting session, section, seconds before I hit the truck, she embraced her situation with a rare and enviable calmness. And like me on the bike, I think she surprised herself with a newfound grace and resolve. She didn't resist cancer or try to control it. She ignored the noise, aware that so much was out of her control. She focused on her desire to live today, knowing that this was all she could control and all that mattered. My mother mastered the art of falling and it saved her life. Wow. And um, the second story is part of my story. So it goes like this. It's called Two Tiny Green Blades of Grass. Um, the Will to Live. I'm deeply honored to be asked to contribute some thoughts to this book. In thinking of what I've learned after 52 years of practicing medicine and 62 years of personal experience with significant problems that might be useful to someone who is newly diagnosed, many things came to mind. There are countless articles, even whole books about them all. So I'm writing about something closer and more personal, something woven into our very fabric that we may never have noticed, something that has made all the difference. Over time, it's been called many names, but I would like to call it by one of its oldest names, the will to live. I first encountered the will to live as a young teen. I was walking up Fifth Avenue on a Saturday morning 
window shopping with my posse of friends, when a flash of green caught my eye. There, growing through the New York City sidewalk, were two tiny green blades of grass. Small and tender, they had broken right through the cement to reach the sun. The image is still perfectly clear in my mind. As a New Yorker, I had never witnessed the power of living things before. I had been awed by the miracle. My first personal experience with the will to live happened several years later when I was a young physician. In 1981, I developed peritonitis and sepsis when the sutures holding my intestine together gave way a few hours after a six hour abdominal surgery. By the time this was correctly diagnosed, I'd become gravely ill. I was rushed back to the operating room where further surgery saved my life. I remember being pushed down a corridor at a dead run, the lights overhead flashing by, my surgeon, who was also my friend, running alongside my gurney. Medical culture being such as it is, he was talking to me about my case as if we were two physicians lunching together in the doctor's dining room talking about a mutual patient. <laughs> you know, he said conversationally, because of the infection, we will have to close by secondary intention. Filled with drugs and very ill, I remember thinking, Secondary intention, I used to know what that means. <laughs> <laughs> then events accelerated, and I lost track of it all. Hours later, I awoke in the recovery room, giddy with the realization that I had survived. Half conscious, I cautiously explored my abdomen with a fingertip. There was the same big, soft bandage that had been there after each of my many surgeries. Comforted by the familiar, I drifted off. The next morning, a nurse appeared to change my dressings. Chatting comfortably with me, she pulled back my bandages, and I looked down, expecting to see the usual 16-inch incision with its neat row of 100 or more stitches. Instead, there was a great gaping wound as open as any I'd ever seen while assisting in the operating room. My surgeon's words came back to me with a rush, secondary intention, but today I can remember what this meant. In the presence of infection, there could be no sutures. The surgical incision would simply be left open to heal on its own. Deeply shocked, I looked down at the wound of my abdomen. I remember thinking, surely this is a mortal wound. There is no way that this can heal. My nurse chatted on cheerfully as she replaced my bandages, unaware of my shock. The next morning she was back to change my dressings again. This time I turned my face aside and closed my eyes. She spoke to me pleasantly as she tended to my physical needs. I didn't answer. I was in despair. For several mornings, we went through the same routine together, she removing my bandages, murmuring encouragement. I had averted waiting for the end. After a week or so, it occurred to me that against all probability, I was still here. Uh, perhaps I was not going to die of this great wound after all, but would have to live with it. This raised a completely different <laughs> set, of, set of concerns and worries. How was I going to live with this great deep hole in my front? Perhaps after many years it might fill in and become flat, a scar 16 inches long and several inches wide. In the meantime, how would I bathe? Could I wear extra large clothes or fill in the deep trench in my belly with cotton so it wouldn't show? After a few days of such musings, it became obvious to me that if I were going to have to live with this, I would need to see it. So that day, when my nurse pulled back my bandages, I forced myself to look 
expecting to see the huge gaping wound of ten days before. But it had changed. Astounded, I saw that it had begun closing in at the bottom and was distinctly narrower. And then a remarkable thing began to happen. Day after day, my nurse would pull back at the dressings, and I would watch as this great wound, in the slow, patient way of all natural things, gradually became a long, thin, hairline scar. And I, as a physician, was not in control of this. It was humbling, yet I certainly had a front row seat. <laughs> so do you. So perhaps it's useful to remember at the beginning that there is a tenacity towards life that is our birthright. It exists in every one of our millions of cells. The will to live is present even in the most elderly and in the tiniest of human beings. The power of the life force in those two little green blades of grass so long ago is there in us all. So I want to say a few words about dancing with the life force or learning how to fall. About a year after I saw the blades of grass as a teenager, um, I was diagnosed with Crohn's, uh, which is the disease I've lived with all of my life. And at the time I was diagnosed, a group of experts in white coats gathered around me and my family, and they told us the facts. No one knew what caused this disease. There was no cure for it. I would have multiple surgeries and gradually lose all of my intestine, and I could expect to be dead by the time I was 40. So at 15, this was not my dream of the future. I had something very different uh, in mind. But it was a time of great darkness and despair, and my family is a medical family. In two generations of my family, there's something like, oh, 10 doctors and four nurses, something like this. And none of us question what we have been told. And I made many life decisions, irrevocable life decisions, based on this information. Decisions about marriage, decisions about children. It didn't seem right to start something I knew I wasn't going to be able to finish. And it would be years before I would make any connection between those two tiny green blades of grass I had seen the year before and me. Thinking back on this, if only one of the many docs around me had suggested that maybe there was something in me that could find a way to break through this obstacle. Something that could learn how to fall. Something medicine couldn't measure or even understand. And perhaps I could find this, strengthen it in myself. It made a huge difference, but no one did. And now that I've been trained as a physician myself, I understand why no one did. Um, they didn't tell me because they simply didn't know. You don't find will to live under W in Harrison's Essentials of Internal Medicine. <laughs> this is not something you learn from a textbook. It's something you learn by being open to observe life itself. To observe life itself. And I think it's sad, you know, because all these years, there still is no known cause or cure for Crohn's. And I live with this problem daily. I have had nine major abdominal <coughs> surgeries. I no longer have most of my intestine. But I've not been dead to pass 37 years. <laughs> <laughs> And I want to 
wanted to just say a few words about learning to fall. And again, this is just my opinion. It comes from a practice that I had with people with cancer um, because um, they needed someone to talk to and the people who felt that they couldn't cure them uh, had felt they had nothing to offer them, and so they sent them my way. And I talked to people and listened to people more important than talking to people for about 30 years. And what I learned about the will to live is that it can't be measured. It is because of this, of course. It's beyond the reach of science. And it's very important to remember in a highly technological and scientific psych psychology, it's almost like science has become a religious thing you know, that describes the nature of the universe, right? Um, it's very hard to consider <coughs> that life is larger than science. Many things happen that science can't explain, that things that can't be analyzed, predicted, and certainly not understood, but they happen. So perhaps we can't really allow science to define life for us, to decide for us what is real and what is not real. Because if we def do that, we will always define life too small. And we will always define ourselves and the realm of the possible too small as well. You know, there are many things that cannot be understood. Uh, as a physician, my profession focuses on understanding things. Because if you can understand and analyze, you can control. If you can measure, you can control. But knowing something is true is more important than understanding it. You know, um, after all these years of being a physician and a teacher to physicians, I would say that it's possible to study and research life for many years without knowing life at all. Yeah. 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 And life is present right here, right now, in this room. This is what it looks like. The will to live is not an idea. It's an experience. And it's something that we all have experienced. And I just wanted to say a few, just offer a few ideas. And these are personal ideas. This is not truth. Or, but you know, um, there are things that strengthen the will to live. You know? And when you get a diagnosis, maybe you want to sort of be curious about those things because they're different for each one of us. Um, and it's not about strengthening your fighting spirit. I mean, that's medicine. Medicine is all about the fighting spirit. Let's talk about life. It's about strengthening your sense of aliveness, of the joy of simply being, just being. And for some people, music does that. It doesn't for me. For some people, being in your garden does that. For some people, being out in nature does that. For some people, being in a crowd of celebrating people does that. For some people, swimming in the ocean does that. You know, we need to go to the place. We need to study ourselves with attention. Most people don't pay attention to us. Do we feel our sense of aliveness most strongly? And we need to either go there or go there in our imagery. Right? And I used to teach an image, I just want to um, mention it mind body connection. It's getting much more respectable than it used to be in the old days. Right? But you know, you imagine yourself. In that situation, or if it's something like music, you put on Beethoven's Fifth, right? And you just lie there and let it wash over you. And you feel that sense of aliveness, and then you pay attention. Where in my body is this most concentrated? And you put your attention right there. 
and then you allow it to spread up, down, back, forward. You allow that sense that you're experiencing to absolutely fill you, and then you let yourself overflow and radiate a lightness into the room. Do it every time you're at a stop sign. Every time you're on hold on the right? It's simply remembering your birthright. Your birthright and strengthening you. And actually going to places, doing things, either in imagery or, or for real, that do strengthen your sense of and it's so hard to put this in words. For me, it feels like joy, but it's much deeper than that. It's aliveness. And we each experience this in our own way. And I have begun to do this every day for five minutes. And all the people who are my friends who are Zen meditators are worried that I don't meditate. And my consciousness will not be. This is what, <laughs> <laughs> this, this is what has been given to me. And it's actually given to all of us to meditate on And then let me talk about something a little bit more controversial. Then we're going to open this to discussion. Yeah. <laughs> One of the things I notice in just listening to a lot of people, just witnessing their situation, and listening in such a way that eventually they were telling me things that they were hearing for the first time as well. Um, is that there are many people who, for some reason or other, have some reservation about their right to be alive. There, there were people who would express to me in one way or another that maybe they deserved to have cancer because of, and that because of was something that had happened either years ago or something, a flaw that they found in themselves, some way that they were not good enough. And this is something that you also may want to pay attention to. Because the will to live is as powerful in every one of us as the two little tender green blades of grass that come through the New York City cement. But all we have to do is unblock that. We don't have to make that happen. It's, it's always been happening to us. We just have to unblock it. So I want the people to, to begin to reflect on any kind of obstacles um, that they feel that make them squeeze, their, squeeze down themselves in some way. These could be just regrets. Oh, I should have done this. Or, oh, that first boyfriend, boy, I was just terrible to him and so cruel. And, um, and you know, all these stories that people would say, it was so clear that they were not the person who took that action. They were the person who was different from that, who had been changed by taking that action, and felt that they were in a position of regret, that there was no way back. But of course there is. You know, I remember one man who said, I never visited my mother when she was so ill, and she asked me to come so many times, and I never went to see her. And I said, well, you know, you need to apologize to her for that, and um, to make restitution. And she said, she's been dead 20 years. I said, irrelevant. <laughs> <laughs> and you write yourself in an apology, and then you do something that is for you an act of restitution. And on the simplest level, maybe you go to read to old people who are alone in nursing homes, and you do that once a week for a while, see what happens. Um, or you do something, whatever it is, that for you offers a healing, offers a way of living, a way of living from the wisdom that you have learned from this thing. Um, most of what people told me about themselves was so untrue. I don't remember anybody telling me anything. As a matter of fact, that really was true. We all deserve to be. Many of us have received don't be messages in our lifetime. Reflecting on these and turning them around 
do you have anything that is regretful? Um, I think it's helpful. It's about getting behind your own birthright, not choking it down, breathing full. So I offer you this, because you know, so many people say, we were talking about this, you know, how did you do it, right? <laughs> did you eat peaches every day for yeah. 30 days? I mean, what did you do? How did you make this happen? No need to make it happen. Unblock it. Mm. It's already happening. Mm. As you're sitting here, it's happening. And it will happen undiminished in you. So looking at whatever gets in the way of you living out loud, consider it. Whether or not you're dealing with a physical challenge or not. It's just the wisdom, isn't it? Yeah. So that's all I have to say. <laughs>
about the possibility. I think what I hear from, from Rachel all the time is it's always the possibility. You've got to hold the possibility. Those guys don't know, you know, but let's, let's hold the possibility. You know, it's not even that you have to hold the possibility. It's there. What you need to do is remember that possibility is what life is about. Life is always got a growing edge. Life is always surprising and amazing. Uh, life is rarely predictable. I don't know if your life is predictable. Mine certainly has not been predictable at all. Right? So it's about remembering what's real. Possibility is what's real. Yeah. And that, I think, is for me very, very, it's not like I don't have to make it happen anymore I need to make the world happen. I just need to remember. Yeah? If anyone, oh, yeah, I know you. Yeah, well, I just wanted to add a couple of things. To Would you stand up sort of? Oh, okay. Do you want to use it? Oh, okay. I just wanted to add a couple of things to what you were talking about with the <laughs> surprise and what, what was good for you today, and that is uh, I have found that practicing gratitude every night and every morning is just as valuable as doing stuff like that. And the way I've practiced it over the past 20, 30, I don't even know how long it's gone, I've uh, used uh, just three things that I was grateful for each day. I say that to myself at night before I go to bed, and when I wake up, I do the same thing again. And usually I review the previous day, and some days are just so overwhelming with the things that I'm grateful for. So it, it just brightens every day and relaxes every evening. Oh, I, I was when I was very young. I had a lot of tumors, and and I really thought everything was just going was really. So when I was very young, I was growing a lot of tumors, and they they kept being benign. But I was really worried that I wasn't going to live the way things were going. And I'll never forget a friend of mine said to me, and she said, "Don't you dare let any doctor give you a death sentence." Yeah. And you know, I never forgot that because it's really true. None of us really know. And I'm I'm fine. I never grew after about five or six. I never grew any others and I'm fine and but I really thought that I was dying the way they were talking to me. It was so serious and she said, Don't let those doctors give you a death sentence. They don't have any right, they have no idea. And I think that's really good too. If you go to a doctor who starts telling you how long you have to live that's the wrong doctor, because none of us know, and you guys are all living proof of that. So. Yeah, that's one of the things I hate the most. You know, go get your affairs in order. Yeah, yeah. Yes. yeah. yeah. That's making you think negatively. It's making you feel the opposite as well. My dad just said, don't deprive us of any pleasure. It's much more important to me. Thank you. I have to be over the video. Can you stand up and just I'm tell me? Sure. Before you raise my hand, uh, <laughs> Daphne came a little late, but she's one of the superstars in our book, and I just wanted to give you a chance to introduce yourself. Oh, thank you. Well, I'm Daphne yeah. Evans, and I've gone through ovarian, breast, and spinal cancer. Show off. <laughs> <laughs> Um, just to touch on what the near doctor said, um, you have given me um, the, the words of what I've already experienced that I didn't realize what was happening. And, and I'll just try to make it very, very quickly. With my spinal cancer, I had uh, a tumor that was bumping against my spine, and I set my affairs in, affairs in order. and moved out of the area to Springfield, Missouri. And I think Nancy, I may have known you at that time and created a legacy for myself. And, and uh, um, I have a cancer foundation called Heaven's Door. I've had it for 10 years. And I send women to spas and resorts all over the country while they're battling cancer. So we, we send them to Berkeley and the highest end spas 
so they can have something wonderful to 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 look forward to while they're doing that. We do it in celebration. We do it during hospice, the whole thing. Um, so I decided to create a healing home in Missouri and and leave that as my legacy. And one day, uh, a lady came to me and said, "I have been." Uh, called to be your mother and you cannot help anyone else unless you're you're well yourself and she says I want you to come to my house and she was a wife a retired FBI agent who had a 30,000 square foot home wow. and she brought me into her home with my two little dogs and began each day the positive of getting calling me on the intercom, darling, what do you want for breakfast? We're having organic this, that, and the other. And she wow. served me. This woman that I barely knew served me. And we would have times in the morning of talking the positive and going through things in my life of things that I needed to release on that. And I was still going through the pain and I said, I'm going through 24 hour a day pain. I have to make the decision to do the surgery, I'm afraid they're going to sever my spinal cord. Please help me to have the strength to go through this because I do want to live now. I don't want to die. And I was like, I'm out of the death. I want to live. I feel like I have more to do. And she had a group of people that came around me and just hugged me and just different faiths and it just hugged me and gave me this amazing energy where I felt something hit the top of my head and go down my spine. And she felt it as well. And I'm very pragmatic, Nancy knows. I manage a law firm. I, <laughs> I'm very pragmatic on that and I felt this and she felt it too. And then she's like, wow, what was that? And I was like, well, I'm still in pain. So um, <laughs> it didn't go away. And then I went to my doctor and they said, yes, because of your blood pressure, your pain indicator, your blood pressure is like 200 over 100. You're getting ready to have a stroke. We've got to do the surgery. We have to remove this, this uh, tumor off of your spine. And I went back to the, my friends and said, give me the strength to go through this surgery. And they, again, some of them cried. They just all oh, helped me. These people I didn't even know just held on to me and gave me part of themselves. And so I went for my MRI and I am a woman of faith and a nurse had on the, her desk, before you call, I will answer. While you are yet speaking, I will hear. And I went into the MRI and three days later they called me and said, are you sitting down? I'm like, what? They said the tumor has disappeared. Um, and I'm like, you're, no. I went into straight denial. And they said, it looks literally, you have gone into spot, they call it spontaneous regression. They said, it looks like someone has scooped the tumor out of your spine. We see the damage of the nerves. And immediately, because I've had metastases, I said, did you look all over my body? Did it look over <laughs> <laughs> my like, No. We knew you were going to ask that. And they said, we, and so they were like, we want you to, you know, continue your pain medication and everything. And I said, I want to be off of everything. I said, if I have been brought this far in my life, then I do not want to be on any medication. And within a, like two months, I was off of every antidepressant, every morphine pill, everything. And I came back to San Francisco. And um, that was in 2010, and 2011, I came back. And there was a little old homeless lady on the street. And she just wanted to pet my dogs. And she looked at me, and she said, you didn't die last year for a reason. Mm -hmm. Do the work that you were supposed to do. Oh, and I'm like, I just went oh, like this, yes ma'am. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and that's when you know that you've been called. And that's how I met with Nancy. And I have been encouraging women and men ever since, from ex executives to, to women that are in hospice, loving on them going to the hospitals, being with them when they're coming out of surgery, praying with them before they go in, and sending them to high end spas and Jerry's the only writer here. We do have, the 
it's male, but I mean, we do have about six men in our book, so do not feel this is a woman's story. Come on, guys. Who wants to do this? Okay. Well, yes. Hi, Hi Nancy. Hi. Hi, Rachel. I love this. I can't wait to see a copy and share it with the world. Um, I'm not in the book. But I've had, um, I'm on Daphne's board. That's why I ordered the revolutions. Um, I've had five episodes of cancer, two breast cancers, and melanoma, and a couple of skins. And I remember talking to someone who was talking about heart disease, and they were really traumatized. And I'm thinking, oh my god, heart disease. Give me cancer. I can deal with that. <laughs> um, in 2006, my oncologist fired me because I was choosing my own path. And I think the message I simply want to leave here, in addition to everything you all are saying, is trusting our intuition, being congruent, because I counsel in healthier approaches to conquering cancer, being congruent with our path of choice. Mm -hmm. I had a consultation this morning for two hours with this woman whose husband was fighting her. It was horrible because it, it lowers your immune system. When you're congruent with what you're choosing to do on your path, your mind-body medicine is not fighting you. And there are so many, so much science on mind-body medicine. And also I wanted to mention, if I could, somebody else who admires you, Nancy and your book, Dr. Kelly Turner with the radical remissions. And Jerome saw her speak at Commonwealth Club. Um, all these things that you're doing and people like Kelly are doing to support people like me and all of us who've had cancer episodes, there's so much the traditional medicine doesn't know. There are hundreds of thousands of radical remissions without any science behind it. Mm -hmm. And we're trying, Kelly's trying to get NIH to do a study on these hundreds of thousands of people to document it to support <coughs> us to balance off the download of everything else that's being said. That's what I wanted to share. Mm -hmm. Yes. Turner's work. Look it up. She wrote this wonderful book, Radical Remission. She's actually got a wonderful review on our book. So mm -hmm. I think all of the writers, I want you to really check it out because next month, I think <coughs> next month, she's writing a great big article about our book and my story, etc. But uh, she's a superstar. Really lucky to have her. Okay, I think we're ready to sign some books if anybody wants. Um, I want to invite you all to talk to these amazing people that are in this room. They're ready. They're going to tell you anything you'd like to know from them. They're also ready to sign books. So, um, just because some of you came in late, could the authors who are here just stand up and wave so people know? Okay. How wonderful is that? Thank <laughs> you.